Greetings to everyone. This is webinar number four of our series, uh, NASA Earth Observations for Energy Management. And I'm glad you can join us for this presentation entitled How to Utilize NASA Resources for Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Applications. And in particular, we're going to be overviewing some of the applications possible with our Power GIS Web Services tool. So first, let's just define and review what power was. We used webinar three to review uh, power in entirety, but power stands for the prediction of worldwide energy resources. This is a project funded by NASA's Applied Science, Earth Applied Science program. And the objective is to facilitate the usage of NASA's research, whether from direct observations or analysis or modeling, to answer uh, key societal questions in these areas down below, renewable energy development, building energy efficiency and sustainability, and even agricultural uh, applications. And particularly, we're building a number of parameters that we develop around the surface solar radiance, which is the amount of energy from the sun that's transmitted through the atmosphere to the surface of the earth. And that is the key parameter. And all the other parameters that we div are provide uh, help supplement and uh, inform uh, around that key parameter. So I wanted to show just a little bit of how we react to the various communities. In our last webinar, we talked about the, the various scientific projects from which we obtained the input uh, data products that we serve through our power tool and um and so these are depicted here we we work with the series project that stands for clouds earth radiant energy system another research project called the nasa gux surface radiation budget that's uh, gux stands for the global energy and water cycles exchange and then the uh, modeling group at nasa goddard called the global modeling and assimilation office uh, and so so we maintain those key relationships so that we uh, are not only help develop these data products, but improve them. And we do so interacting with various aspects of the community. We, we develop relationships with and partnerships with um, community users and organizations. Uh, and we've done so, th so through the course of our history so that we understand the sorts of parameters that are needed and statistical representation of those parameters to maximize their usefulness for these areas that we are hoping to uh, apply Earth, op Earth observations to. Uh, then we also uh, partner with, uh, with those in the technology area. We, we've partnered with our own Atmospheric Science Data Center here at NASA Langley. We're developing a partnership actually with the Goddard uh, uh, Data Center as well. And, and then we've worked with uh, researchers at NOAA for various different inputs and surface measurements and uh, to help us with the validation of products. Then, of course, we provide these, these information to the users and try to interact with the users so that we can better uh, provide data products and accessibility options. That, that help them utilize the products and understand them. So, so we have in the past, we've, well, we've, we have three main relationships I want to describe for you today. And, and this first one is with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory that, that was really one that we started many years ago and, uh, and uh, resulted in, a, in, in our early uh, supply of data uh, for a project called SWARE, the Solar and Wind Energy Resource Assessment. And it's, we have maintained a uh, working relationship with NREL, um, and we're hoping for some future uh, opportunities. But early on, working with NREL was very instrumental in, in providing the data and helping us know what quantities are needed for the, for the uh, users, particularly on a global basis. And that's why this map is global because our data products have always been global. And NREL has been mainly focused on the US, although it's expanded into Central America and, uh, and, uh, and South America, and also even uh, over here in uh, into India. But, um, 
so they have been working, but we provide data, for instance, that covers very northern territories of Canada and, and, and Alaska, and that's been very helpful. So we, we hope to continue to work and even strengthen uh, some, uh, some relationships with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in the future. We've also worked with uh, the team at the Natural Resources Canada called Red Screen, which stands for Renewable Energy Technology Screen, and they've developed a an engineering uh, tool as a clean energy tool that essentially does the engineering part for decisions and feasibility and assessments of renewable energy projects. And they needed global data products so the tool could be used all around the world. And so we have worked with this te team for almost 20 plus years, and we'll talk more specifically about our relationship with them. But um, so, but they have also helped us in, in how we present the, uh, uh, the data products to the users. And for the last decade or so, we've worked with this organization called ASHRAE, which was formerly known as the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. And we've worked with them to demonstrate the usefulness of NASA Earth observations and modeling. They were an organization that was tied specifically to surface sites only. And I think through our relationships, we've showed, shown the utility of using Earth observations to really supplement those and including the atmospheric reanalyses that we feature through the power data products. Well, this, this figure here is just meant to provide an overview of the source of usage that we get. So one of the things we do try to do is track uh, how users use the power data uh, site and um, so this this little loop here depicts um, the location of the users. We don't actually keep track; it's still anonymous and free access. But we we're able to track the location of the servers from which they access the website from, and then and then uh, where they uh, request data for. And so the blue arcs or the teal arcs connect those two and you can see there's users spread out all around the world and that they request data from various locations in the world even over the oceanic regions and uh, we've even had usages along and seen ship tracks uh, as, as ships have used the data through and so the the bottom tables just give you a sense of how many uh, requests we fulfill almost 150 million requests per month after for this current version uh, with uh, unique users that unique users that means just a, uh, in terms of an IP we don't have a, a registration per se but we just um, can track of individual IPs which is a proxy so for unique IPs there's almost uh, about 275 thousand plus for that and so cumulatively uh, since we released this current um, current uh, version we're we're fulfilled over 180 uh, million orders. And this compares to uh, nearly uh, 20 years of the old version where we fulfilled 36 million. So, so we actually have, uh, in the last three years, uh, provided data to almost five times the requests. I think that's just a testament of the uh, growing usage of these data in the communities and the interest in renewable energies and uh, and sustainable technologies. So what sorts of data help enhance power's utility? And what I wanted to emphasize on this slide is the fact that power makes available to users long-term average data products and time series data products. And so the top figure here shows a long-term average of surface solar irradiance uh, from 1990, uh, 1988 through June uh, through 2009, whereas the bottom figure shows a, a daily average uh, loop uh, for a period um, in, it looks like, April 2001. And so, so there's different sorts of usages uh, that, um, that are possible. Uh, from long-term averages versus the time series. For instance, if long-term averages can be used for the feasibility studies. So this, on average, 
and with its statistical information about the variability in that long-term average, you can get a sense of this, the, the resource, for instance, for the solar resource or the, or the main temperature and humidity properties of that particular area. Uh, and we've, in our new beta version we're, that we're uh, trying out now and hope to promote in the fall, we're allowing users to pick their own uh, years for climatologies. And then, of course, we allow for time series, uh, and this allows for you to use the actual observed variability for modeling energy systems, whether those energy systems are solar panel attached to a building or, or independent of a grid or, or where they are. And um, so you can, you can assess the actual day-to-day -day variability with the real variability uh, that's been observed for as long of a time period as you wish. So you can do that for uh, building energy uh, systems like heating and air conditioning systems. And, um, and so the current version allows for that to be on the daily version, which is depicted here, but the new version will allow 20 years of hourly data to be used for modeling purposes. Well, also, so, so the climatological averages we don't just provide the, the uh, long-term averages of our base parameters. Those, those are here, climatological base parameters in terms of our uh, all-sky. All-sky refers to clouds and clear conditions for the surface insulation on a horizontal surface. And uh, albedo, or the surface reflected solar flux. Uh, we do have thermal infrared or long-wave radiated fluxes. Uh, and and so these are the in the air temperatures and specific humidity, surface dew point. These are the basic meteorological and solar parameters that are useful in, the, in and of themselves. But we've, since we've worked with the community, we've also understand that they need in, different information to u, utilize those. So one of those is the solar geometry. This is just a little depiction of a typical solar geometry uh, for, say, a solar panel. This is a complicated solar panel in that it can rotate on an axis, but uh, if you orientate this, uh, say, to toward uh, the equator, which we'll talk about in a bit, you have a tilt angle here, and also you have a solar azimuth angle, and so these angles are depicted here, and we'll provide uh, averages, uh, long-term averages of these quantities to help with the configuration an understanding of how to use our all sky so for solar irradiances. And we'll also use that information to compute estimates of direct normal and diffuse and other components that are useful for the sizing and configuration of solar panel arrays. And, and so one of the things that we do provide is tilted so tilted surface solar primer. So so not only this is on a parameters are on a horizontal surface, but, but panels are typically tilted, and particularly if you put them on a, mount them on a panel or on a roof, they have a certain pitch or a tilt. And so we can estimate uh, for fixed angles. Um, we'll show you that in a, in a second, but the, the idea is it's a non-horizontal surface. How does, how does tilting that affect the amount of energy that you'll, 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 that is incident on that panel? We also provide some statistical measurements of of the variability of the sunlight and this no sun days or black sky days parameter is really just uh, a consecutive day uh, statistical threshold that that helps uh, users understand the sorts of battery backup that are needed. For temperatures we derive quantities like heating and cooling degree days which we'll describe a little later and also things like the skin temperature of the earth. So this isn't the temperature at two meters above the surface, but actual temperature of the earth itself. This, this has been proved useful uh, for, um, for uh, thermal, thermal systems. Uh, and then we have uh, information about the water vapor. I didn't put it here, but ozone is here. And, uh, Asteroid building, climate, thermal, and moisture zones. We'll talk about that today. And uh, wind roses, which we divide out in energy classes. We'll mention that briefly today, too. So it's not just the base climate, climatological parameters, but these value added that helps the users, uh, enables them to, to use 
uh, and apply the data uh, for their particular problems. So I wanted to just take one moment to describe a little bit about our uh, tilted surface parameters that we provide. Here again is that figure showing the orientation of a panel. And so, so a, a typical first estimate to tilt a panel would be to tilt it toward the direction of the equator. Uh, and of course, this depends on your location. So. Uh, if you're in the northern hemisphere, you're pointing it south. If you're in the southern hemisphere, you're pointing it northward. And it depends on, on your latitude. So, so a lot of uh, designers will, just as a first estimate, uh, tilt your, your system toward the equator at an angle, a tilt angle that is, um, that is uh, equal, equivalent to the latitude of your location. And so, so we provide a set of tables. So if we go to our data access viewer in our tool, which we overviewed in, in our last webinar, you can uh, get first, you can go to the uh, tool that does the layer uh, list and get, a, uh, get an image of uh, latitude tilt radiation, uh, we call it. So you can get a sense of how that varies. And then, um, then you can also go through our single point access viewer and order uh, solar radius for equator tilted surfaces. And in this parameter, you'll get a table. And this table gives you, so in this particular case, um, the latitude of the observer was about 37.9 degrees. And so we'll give them a, a tilted estimate at 37 degrees. Uh, that's the uh, equator tilt angle but also plus or minus 15 degrees relative to that angle to see how the solar radiance varies for, uh, for all the conditions. And I should mention that this is for all conditions. So this includes how the clouds uh, attenuate that solar irradiance as well. So that's considered. We also give a vertical surface and a horizontal, a horizontal surface is a tilt of zero and a vertical surface is 90 degrees to give the users a sense for how that irradiance varies uh, as a function of angle. And then we also provide an estimate of the optimal tilt. So what would be a tilt angle that would give the optimal solar radiance given those average conditions, long-term average conditions of cloudiness at that particular location? So this becomes a way uh, that users can assess and use those, use those uh, tilted information. Um, we also have attempted and put this in our me our methodology documentation, some validation of this. And it's very hard to validate tilted surface solar irradiance because there's such a lack of observations. One of the observations we tested was from this station here at Cheney, Washington, which gets tilted at 45 degrees. And you can see our comparison there for our um, in this case, we call it SSE, surface solar irradiance. But you can see our estimates relative to uh, the measurements here in the purple when they follow very well on a month-to-month -month basis. And uh, we've also devised using horizontal uh, uh, measurements on a horizontal surface a technique to uh, estimate uh, and try to compare that. So we've made an attempt to at least provide some uncertainty information, which we've described in our methodology. So let's look at a few examples of how we can use our, our data products uh, for real, real world problems. And um, in this case, we're looking at the utility of these long-term uh, uh, climatological averages, solar irradiance. And, and here we, uh, we communicated with a consultant that was called to help in evaluation of an African community solar power system. Here's a picture of that system. You can see the solar panels that were arrayed in the community. Notice that they're arrayed at a tilt. It's a relatively uh, low tilt because this is a tropical location. Well, the community expected uh, a certain amount of energy and, and they weren't getting the energy from these panels that they thought they, they needed. And so the consultant went ahead and pulled our long-term data products at the, at the location of the users and uh, found uh, our long-term averages by month. And you can see here, this is the 
what we call the direct normal radiation. So this is the, how much energy uh, from the sun uh, that's directly transmitted. Uh, so, so if you can see the disk of the sun and you have a plane uh, perpendicular to that direction, that's the amount of energy that we're talking about here. So, so you can see here month by month averages and you can see that even though a tropical location, there's a very high amount in, in these uh, in January, February, November, December, but the direct normal goes to a very low amount here in the August and September timeframe. And so from a climatological perspective, the amount of energy that would be received on these panels is really decreases in this, in this June to uh, October period. So the consultant was able to get a table of these values and, and even some min and max. Then they were able to pull, and, and as then they're able to pull a map from our image services to show the relative minimum uh, for this location, and and then here's a blow up of that. Uh, so there's a relative minimum of energy uh, received at this location, um, and it turns out that this is due to the fluctuation of cloudiness in the region. So here are the long-term averages by month of the various clouds. So you can see here that, that at the nine of the 12 months of the year have a climatological cloud fractions greater, cloud amounts greater than 50%, uh, that the annual average was 60%. So when they, when they designed the system and managed it, they weren't accounting properly for the, for the, for the changes in clouds by month. And so using, using this information that, that was available through the Power website, the consultant was able to work with the community, get them to better understand the amount of energy that they should be receiving. And they found that the system was producing the proper amount of energy. It's just that they didn't have as much energy as they thought they should. So they had to make some adjustments to the way they build it because uh, they didn't have as much as they thought. And, and they were able to work with that and uh, do some uh, redesigning so, so to uh, help manage it better. So, so that is just one example of how we can use climatological averages. And here is another. Um, so, so this is a project developed as a uh, NASA student-led project. So this was a, a, a group of students that led a project over uh, a summer, and summer of 2020. And um, they worked with the city of Satellite Beach, Florida. And uh, Satellite Beach decided that they wanted to, they wanted to work towards supplying 100% of its energy used from renewable energy uh, by the year 2050. And, and to do that, they wanted to try to get an assessment of how much potential uh, energy could be produced uh, with solar rooftop solar panels. And so what they did is they used uh, the long-term average uh, power plus the tilted surface parameterizations that we were able to provide. We actually provided them uh, a routine so they can compute all the angles uh, and uh, get a set of uh, set of data for this uh, particular region. Uh, and then they used uh, light detection and ranging, uh, basically a, a, the LIDAR system that mapped out the, the rooftops of the satellite beach. So what they're able to use using the long-term average, even though we're of course resolution, it provided the background information needed, and then they're able to supplement that with the high resolution information to, uh, to estimate various tilts and pitches of the, uh, of the various uh, roofs and uh, look at that as a function of month and estimate the solar potential. So you can hear, see here a little flow diagram. They use the information about the sun position that we computed and also our tilted surface irradiance uh, as a background. And then they provided uh, the high resolution LIDAR to do all the slope and uh, slope segments and slope aspects. They used the GIS sort of system to do this analysis and the data products they were able to download from us were uh, readily input into that uh, system. And so they were able to get uh, estimates of energy for the whole city. And that was presented to the, to the city council. 
and uh, and so hopefully that's uh, moving forward uh, in their work. Maybe they'll probably use this since it was a student-led project. They'll probably commission um, some uh, en engineer professionals to take a even closer look. But the the results of the project were very positive for the city of Satellite Beach. We also provide wind parameters. So the wind parameters that we provide are coarse resolution and. And so many wind energy um, uh, folks rely on very high resolution because there's to uh, complex topography that that will change winds. But with the coarse resolution, you can certainly get a sense of the distribution of of winds in uh, in and particularly even uh, the temporal variation of those winds uh, for large regions. And so. We, we've, there's been a number of papers written using uh, the MERA-2, which is our atmospheric reanalysis that we input. And, and this particular example, uh, they took the wind fields from MERA-2 and they uh, devised a, an average capacity factor for wind energy and plotted that here over the uh, nation of uh, China. So, and they did up many other regions as well. And this is very typical of the sorts of analysis that's done with this coarse resolution wind assess, wind uh, direction. And we provide uh, estimates of uh, a wind in classes uh, that are proportional to the amount of energy uh, that could be potentially harnessed uh, from the wind fields. Uh, so, so this is an example, I think, of of how these wind parameters could be used. Uh, some modelers provide they will use the MERA-2 uh, either through power or, or MERA-2 directly, and then they'll apply that to a very detailed model. So they'll use it as boundary conditions. Um, another use now is for this we have found that the International Association of Marine Aids to, to Navigational and Lighthouse Authorities, this, this organization, made available to its members um, a decision support tool which allowed for uh, the sizing and monitoring of uh, solar powers that were attached to these lighthouse and buoy systems. And um, these are typically disconnected from the grids. And so they really need to understand the amount of power that is available and how that varies. And so this system actually takes advantage of both the climatological averages and the time series data. And so now we're transitioning to uses of our time series data, but as well, this and this, Decision Support Tool uses the daily global all-sky insulation uh, and up to the near real time, uh, which is about uh, currently about seven days in, in uh, relative to real time. Uh, and then they also use those long-term statistics, those black sky days that I mentioned earlier, to because uh, since they're autonomous and not connected to a grid, they need alternate sources of energy, whether it's battery backup or other systems uh, uh, such as generators um, to, uh, to power the needs for the, for the lighthouse. Um, so, so they use that, utilize that black sky days as a way to, to size the batteries. Uh, and then they utilize our tilted irradiance estimates as well. So, so, so those are enabled through, uh, through this organization and uh, have been used at various different uh, lighthouses and buoys around the world uh, in conjunction with uh, this uh, organization. Uh, this is another usage of now the real-time parameters. Um, in this case, we have a user that wants to monitor his solar panel installation. And uh, he, he has a 50 uh, solar panel sites. He manages 50 solar panel sites and produces uh, 5.3 megawatts of power. And he had his own sensor on the ground but he was comparing our sensor to the solar radiance that we provide through power and our near real-time data products. And, and, and from about 2014 to 2017, he got a very good agreement. So 
uh, let me give you an idea of what's plotted here. We the solid lines are the uh, the uh, the data sets that uh, we provide. The blue line actually is from our current uh, near real time data products. The red the orange line is his sensor that he was using to verify. You can see how well those correlate in time uh, on a monthly basis. And um, But if you notice those dotted lines, the dotted lines are the difference between our estimates and the, uh, and the, uh, and the sensor. Well, in about uh, late 2017, he started to see a very large disagreement, a growing disagreement between the sensor and the uh, estimates that we were providing for satellite. So he contacted us and said, what's going on here? Well, in part of our analysis, we pulled in another data set, the SYN one degree data set from Ceres, which will be featured in our new beta version. And we compared that and we can see here that when we looked at our near real time, the new Ceres product, uh, that uh, we got good agreement between our estimates and and the the series product the other series product but not his sensor and sure enough it, beyond the scope of this figure here his sensor essentially disagreed up to about 50 percent well he realized that the sensor was off so by utilizing the the daily average and assessing it he was able to deduce that his sensor was was uh, diverging and it was once it got beyond 10%, he realized that he needed to recalibrate or replace that sensor. Uh, and so, so this is an example of how, uh, of how these data, how well these data replicate uh, this, the irradiance at the surface and that they can be used for not only the monitoring of the system, but also uh, looking for on-site uh, sensors. That uh, to help with the analysis of the energy produced by the system, and likewise, here's another example of someone using the near real time data from uh, power uh, to assess a group of solar uh, uh, solar rays. Uh, these are distributed in North Carolina, and um, he was able to come up with a. Uh, a, a net capacity factor and uh, from his uh, from his various different arrays so each color bar here is a day by day uh, production uh, capacity factor for each of his arrays and then um, and then plotted on that the blue line is the scaled solar irradiance insulation that he he worked up and the point is is that these should should uh, correlate in in time and the variability, but he found some time periods where there was a, a large disagreement, and those were times that he would use to troubleshoot uh, his solar uh, rays. Uh, and uh, one of those times was during a hurricane. Uh, in the aftermath, it was very sunny, but the fields around one or two of the rays were uh, flooded, and the power uh, wasn't able to to be produced from those. Um, and so he was able to estimate the amount of loss uh, be, be due, to the, uh, due to the panels not operating properly. And he is continuing to use, uh, use the power data in this way. Um, well, as I described earlier, one of our key relationships is with uh, the RET screen group as part of Natural Resources Canada and their energy division there. And we have partnered with them, worked with them, collaborated with them really over the last 20 years. And um, so, so as we have improved the ERPS observation estimates of solar irradiance and provided uh, data products from the atmospheric reanalysis, they have Im improved their software as well, uh, expanding the sorts and types of projects that they can they can treat and provide feasibility estimates. This tool provides a complete feasibility uh, estimate of various different projects and includes uh, not only the, uh, the financial return 
uh, from a project in particular areas, but also greenhouse gas savings and other information. So it's a quite a comprehensive tool, and they use both our climatological averages and our uh, near real time uh, daily uh, data for their analysis for different components of their system. So for instance, for the feasibility and uh, benchmark performance and a portfolio analysis, they'll tend to use their long-term averages. Um, but for energy efficiency, heat and heating and cooling, power generation, co-generation that requires time series, uh, they'll use uh, a direct connection to our website. So those sorts of projects are treated with a RET screen. And one of the, the amazing things about this tool is they've provided in 36 different languages, which reaches two thirds of the world's population. So literally a consultant working in, in, in one country speaking one language can send his results to somebody from a different country and, uh, and get the translation and go in between. <clears throat> They've now surpassed the 700,000 global registered users for this uh, tool. So, so as you get into the tool, um, a Red Screen Expert, uh, the latest version here, um, I've uh, the, one of the first steps you'll need to load in is the um, is the climate data. As they call the climate data, and so so this software allows you to input surface measurements if you have them. But many locations, if they have air temperature, humidity, and precipitation, they'll have those. But they may not have the daily solar irradiance or other measurements. And so they'll either use if they have no measurements, they'll use all our NASA products. And if they have uh, just part of them, they'll use what they can and the rest use the NASA data. So a very large percent of all projects planned with Red Screen use the, the data products uh, provided through, uh, through our power uh, archives. So their current version for, uh, for feasibility studies, they use the long-term averages and they've actually uh, embedded those as a database into the software. Now we are reprocessing and going to be promoting this new version, so uh, so uh, they will uh, they'll be deciding on on how they'll they'll do that for the for the new version, and we're going to be uh, releasing a new version later. But you can see the sorts of parameters that they provide: air temperature, relative humidity, precipitation, daily solar uh, radiance, atmospheric pressure, wind speed. Earth temperature, heating, and cooling degree days, um, and these are the climatological averages and the sorts of parameters that are provided. So, one application of of using power with Red Screen is uh, the, this company called Wicked Joe Coffee, up in, located in Maine, which is in the northern U.S. So, it's a relatively uh, low latitude. I mean, a high latitude area, relatively north, and and they had a large facility, about 20,000 square feet, and they were really wanted to try to uh, utilize sustainable um, technologies to uh, save money in their heating uh, heating bills, and so they used the red screen tool to assess a number of technologies and decided a solar wall would be appropriate for their application. Uh, because of the direction of the wall relative to the sun. And um, they uh, estimated that it would save them about 40% on their heating bill. And after they implemented it, they were uh, saving about $10,000 per US dollars per year uh, under this project. This, this, by the way, is written up in detail at this website here called Space for, for Us. And it provides a number of examples of energy related uh, products as well as other, other uses for Earth observations. And um, we also had a user um, in uh, Ottawa who had a solar power plant, but he had a problem. And that was during the winter, he, he the, the snowfall would, would, uh, would cause a, a, 
a decrease in the amount of energy that was captured. Uh, and you can see here, uh, this is uh, a plot. So the these bars here show the amount of uh, electrical energy produced by a solar power system. And the, um, and the dotted lines here are daily solar irradiance. Uh, and and you can see here that for most months of the year, there's a very good correspondence, but not for these months, January and February, where there was, where there was uh, a, a deficit of energy. And it turns out then that this was due to snow cover on the solar panels. And um, so, so, the, so they were able to use red screen to estimate the amount of energy. So, so this green line here was a red screen output using a model that they developed uh, by fitting the, the available solar energy that was provided by estimates from power and what their typical electricity output was for that energy. And if you use that model and apply it for these, these months, where the snow, solar panels were covered, uh, you can see the amount of energy that was lost. So the company now had a, a uh, way to actually estimate the amount of energy uh, and amount of money that was being lost because the energy couldn't be produced. And so, so that allowed them then to estimate uh, whether or not they should pay to get those, uh, those solar panels uh, cleaned off or whether they just, whether it wasn't worth it and they, they would just leave them melt when they melted. So, so I believe in this case, they decided that the energy loss was significant enough that they, they should clean the panels. Uh, we, we actually have some uh, case study here at, um, at uh, NASA Langley itself. And uh, here's where we, um, we use, uh, we have our uh, badge and pass office, which has solar panels. You can see the tilt of these panels. We actually use power to to find the fact that the 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 contractor uh, provided the wrong tilt angle. But uh, once we figured that out, we were able to use the red screen and assess the impact of adding these panels to the building. And so. So what you see here, uh, this figure here shows the very good correlation between the solar irradiance that is estimated uh, through and provided through the power uh, tools. And, um, and the blue here gives the energy production. So you can see the very good correspondence there on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, then over here, you can get the uh, estimate of the actual savings of energy per month that you didn't have to pull from the grid by adding these panels. And Red Screen provides this accumulative sum of energy that, that you can see. And then you can compute, once you have an accumulative sum, you can compute the amount that you saved over the entire year. And you can not only do this for one system, but you can do this for a whole group of, of buildings. And NASA Langley Research Center itself has added to a red screen analysis all the buildings on center. And so as able to assess the performance of those buildings uh, using, um, using the red screen tool and the meteorological uh, data products, for instance, they use relative humidity, daily solar radiance, our heating and cooling degree days, and, the, and their a temperature at two meters. And they developed a model for all the buildings on center. And in this particular uh, example, they looked at the amount of energy that was not used when we had a government in the U.S., we had a government uh, shutdown uh, or a call to furlough for about a month uh, in uh, at the end of 2018 and, 20, and early 2019. And this shows the amount of energy that was not used by the center during that shutdown. They are actually providing a similar analysis for the COVID, but they just haven't finalized that. But so this shows you that, uh, that uh, you can apply the red screen, not just to one building, but to large groups. In fact, other NASA centers are implementing red screen. And, and besides NASA centers, we've had a number of other users like the University of Michigan, uh, the uh, Alaska. Uh, there's 
been usage in the uh, Massachusetts and Minnesota uh, for renewable energy and heating cooling scenarios for policies. Uh, in in uh, Hawaii, Department of Education has been using red screen for their school buildings. Uh, Wisconsin has has uh, used red screen, and I believe the state of Pennsylvania has too for. Uh, energy of solar hot water heater incentive programs uh, for users and businesses. And so, as I mentioned, if you use red screen and you don't have the, uh, the surface data that you want, you will probably use uh, the power data products, uh, either on a climatological basis or the, uh, for monitoring the uh, time series. And uh, for other examples of usages of red screen, uh, the entire um, Canadian government uh, is actually now implementing red screen, and this example here talks about the uh, the Ottawa region, um, and uh, so they're using solar systems using red screen and thus power. 3M has has manages 200 plus facilities worldwide, U.S. and Canada and, and uh, elsewhere. And they're using uh, the data that comes from the time series as well. We've had usages from Spain. Uh, we're looking at uh, solar street lights and Peru and uh, various different countries all around the world, even here, Nokia, uh, looking at for their renewable energy solutions. So red screen is a highly used tool around the world. And, and, and we've been happy to help and partner with them to try to provide data projects to, to help both manage facilities and do feasibility studies for renewable energy technologies around the world. I also mentioned a partnership with the ASHRAE and uh, a group. And um, so they, ASHRAE is an organization that, that uh, essentially is responsible to define building standards uh, for the U.S. and by collaboration, uh, they collaborate with uh, uh, around the world as well. And, and one of the first steps is determining the climate. Uh, what are the average climatological conditions? Because if you size a heating and air conditioning system, you need to consider those. One of the key parameters for that processes called the heating and cooling degree days. And I've put the equations of how to do this. It's, it's a simple uh, equation is based upon you use a base temperature. So, so the idea is how many days in a particular area do you need to provide heating uh, for your building? And how many days do you provide cooling relative to these uh, thresholds? And um, and so what we've been able to do in power is partner with them, compute these, and this uses directly the MERIT-2 atmospheric data simulation that we uh, provided an overview in our last webinar. And, and so this is a depiction of uh, the temperature at two meters here, which is a key input, and the cooling degree day map um, that uh, is provided uh, as, an as an estimate, just to show you this, the global this is this, this global distribution of these quantities of something that the ASHRAE climate committees uh, had not really seen. They've always done things based upon surface measurements. And so this provided a, a way to uh, see that more explicitly and see the variability around the world. And, we, and as power, this is another thing that's in our, our methodology documentation. We do try to validate this. And, and so we, we assess the heating and cooling degree days relative to surface measurements. And so you can see uh, this is for the heating degree days, and you can see statistics here for, this is the incense annual, and we've done the same uh, for cooling. And, uh, and so those uh, statistics are available. And, but that's just the first step toward getting something that ASHRAE uh, derives, which is the building climate zones. And um, they did, so they did determine climate zones. And these climate zones are actually uh, used to designate building standards. And 
And so they have become very important and they spend a lot of time assessing these. And, and what I've provided here is a table of the definitions of these zones. So the zero zone is an extremely hot and humid environment. And, and you can see here that you have cooling degree days uh, and uh, thresholds um, for these, these conditions. Um, and, and so, so that you have also cooling degree and heating degree day thresholds. So using the cooling and heating degree days, you define climate zones. And then also they consider the, the annual and month to month average precipitation to determine whether it's dry or humid in, in this area as well. So, so we've been able to prov provide maps uh, several years ago, we were able to first show them maps using uh, Mera 2, and uh, they have subsequently uh, used those in, the, in their own analysis. They couldn't uh, use our analysis directly, but they were able to uh, to uh, contract someone to create these maps for their for their uh, reports they issue every four years. Um, so. One of the things that we were able to emphasize to them, we were able to derive these climate zone maps. And uh, the top figure here shows the fixed climate zones from 1989 to 2018. And you can see here the white is your hottest and uh, climate zone, and that's in the tropical regions. And then the coldest are, of course, the blue. So that's number eight. And so you see the variability uh, changing as you change latitude. But you'll notice that it doesn't, it's not strict latitudinally because of the influences of the oceanic interactions and, and weather and, and cloud patterns and things. So that in topography, so those all change and have an impact on those climate zones and all those are taken into account. And one of the things that we were able to show them is the, um, is the variability in time. Uh, this, this was, uh, a simulation here uh, and uh, what we were able to do is uh, just to compute these zones for every four years and showed how these uh, evolved in time and so uh, that's a demonstration that uh, that we can see and and it uh, we see variation of these zones uh, in time over the last 30 years well, another thing that we've done with the ASHRAE is to provide a climate design conditions report. And um, this is a report they typically issued uh, just using surface measurements. And we were able to use the MERA-2 to start to fill this out for any location of the world arbitrarily. And we're still working on this. This is part of our new beta version. So you can see a number of parameters which are grayed out because we haven't validate and finalize those but but you could see also that uh, we provide things like the the uh, heating uh, dry db here stands for dry bulb and and uh, various different parameters related to the to the surface two meter temperatures and also the winds and also the wet bulb temperatures uh, which is related to that relative humidity uh, and distributions of those parameters. And uh, so we have heating and cooling degree day averages on an annual basis and by month, uh, wind fields, uh, precipitation, and then uh, even um, uh, another num number of other statistics here are called mean coincidence. So you're looking at the variability of, of temperature and uh, uh, wet bulb even together. So, so this, so this provides this report for any location in the world, and even uh, there's it's not shown here, but there's solar radiance uh, values in this report as well, which we'll be adding to it. So it, this is a new tool that we will provide and uh, to help uh, the ASHRAE community. And one last thing that we're doing for the building community is to provide data uh, in a specialized format. One of those formats is the Energy Plus Weather Format, or EPW. 
This is in our new beta version because it uh, requires hourly data. So from the year, uh, from January 20, uh, 2001, to about two to three months in real time, we'll be able to provide hourly data products for a number of parameters. Uh, there's 18 now, and um, and uh, there's uh, several that will be let, added later. And these include parameters regarding the solar irradiance, uh, even uh, estimates of cloudiness, solar luminance, uh, temperature and humidity, of course, and other uh, other other meteorological parameters uh, needed for the modeling of buildings. Well, with that, I'm going to stop and introduce uh, Bradley McPherson, and he's going to uh, give you a, a, a quick overview of our geospatial data services. And so, uh, Bradley, if you'd like to uh, take over here, we'll, we'll show you some of these uh, services that we're providing. Thank you, Dr. Stackhouse. So now I'm gonna go over the power geospatial data services that we provide. So power provides ArcGIS image service and feature services to allow users to effectively interact with the, the power data store dynamically in GIS applications. So it enables the users to directly connect to the data without having to physically download the data. So it's all remotely communicated back to your GIS application. We provide open geospatial consortium compliance services, so web feature services, um, web WMS services, and many more. So we provide the access to our catalog on the ArcGIS online, at NASA, at Atmospheric Science Data Center, and we have select um, products available at the Esri Living Atlas. You can click this hyperlink at the bottom to send you directly to the, the AGOL catalog at NASA. So this is a little walkthrough how you can navigate from our homepage and go to the, to the different catalogs. This is the ArcGIS online for NASA. And I'm just going to go through a through and show a couple different feature services where you can see the thermal moisture zones. And this enables you to click through in time to see the changes for a specific time range. This is that rolling thermal moisture zones that we talked about in the previous webinar and a little bit in this one. It enables you to click and show the different changes. So in this one here, we're going to be pulling up the, the, the differences. So this is the difference between 1984 and 19, or sorry, 1984 to 1998 to 2004 to 2018. And when we zoom in, we can actually see the changes. So red is warmer, blue is colder, and then you can click on it and it gets a little synopsis of what changed because in the locations, some of the locations it shows changes in the moisture as well as the heat. So it can have a combination of both. Next here is we have we mentioned some of those analytic tools that we have like story maps to show things. So here's a, an older version that we're going to enhance in the future that shows the spatial like bias of the data in like a stepwise way. So it, it lays, lays out in a story that you can walk through and it helps show how the biases are of the data or could be different in different regions and you can zoom in and see them and explore the data and determine if the data is going to be okay for your area of interest. So these tools are going to be integrated into our data access viewing suite. They're available on those catalogs that we previously mentioned and we're eventually going to make those services available on the different GIS uh, tools as well. So if you want to click that link at the bottom, you can look at this one. It's still relevant, but we're going to be making a better and new system going forward in the future. So just a little bit more on that, that video. So you see here on the top right, we have the maps that can show that regional difference of the biases of the data, where previously before we only had what's on the bottom right, which scatter plots and, 
and, bar and um, histograms are very important still, but it just gives another avenue of, of understanding if we can see it in a, in a spatial context. So we pr we'll be adding all these, so we, we're still going to provide the, the static um, scatter plots on our web-based documentation, but this will be an enhanced feature going forward. So another thing that Power is currently providing is we have downloadable Jupyter Notebooks. And primarily, we have one that's publicly available now that is loading on the right here. It enables, it enables you to use uh, Python to connect to the Power API and be able to pull the data directly into your application, just like we were showing in the previous webinar with the Data Access Viewer. We just have a stepwise set of instructions to show you how you can download the data and use it inside a data frame. So we're using the ArcGIS catalog to show the image service, I mean, to show the, the, the access to the API. So it's a single point request that's being used, but we're able to, to use any notebook system. So we presented this as part of the ASDC data presentation in 2020 for the Develop Fellow class. So, and this is publicly available through that hyperlink as well. So feel free to download this. And we will be updating this once we make the beta API public. So currently this uses the current production API, but we will just change the URL out and make it accessible for the new API that is in the beta. And now I'd like to hand it back off to Dr. Stackhouse so we can sum up, summarize what we've learned with uh, some closing remarks. Well, thank you, Bradley, and uh, I hope we I hope that you've really enjoyed this uh, particular webinar and that it helped you understand better the sorts of applications that are possible with our Power GIS Web Services tools. And uh, we just wanted to note then that uh, Power is improved by our continual relationships with the actual NASA science projects that develop these data products so that we can improve them in the future and bring those improvements to the users. We've worked with renewable energy and energy efficient engineers uh, and researchers so that we can provide the parameters and the sorts of quantities, data formats, and units that are useful for the particular applications. And we've worked with organizations such as the Department of Energy's National Renewable Energy Laboratory and ASHRAE and, and uh, Red Screen and other organizations as to try to uh, determine what are the best ways to meet the needs of their members. And, and so we have also developed partnerships with uh, uh, with those organizations as well. And so one emphasis that we had this, this particular webinar was that we provide through the power tool the long-term averages and the time series. And so that enables a variety of different projects and particularly the long-term average products include uh, the value added uh, products like the tilted surface uh, solar radiance and the black sky days and uh, parameters like the uh, heating and cooling degree days and the climate zones that we demonstrated. Um, and so this allows for uh, multiple applications including the solar panel technologies and various configurations and then our time series products allow for the monitoring of solar based systems or building energy efficiency and systems and their performance uh, and to monitor buildings and even clusters of buildings. We showed that uh, we could use uh, the NASA reanalysis through power uh, to, to derive the building climate zones and we're able to develop a depiction of the variability couple of different ways, both with the rolling zones, simulations, and also those differences, and uh, using this GIS and other analytical tools. So the upcoming new version of the Power GIS Web Services is under continual development through the relationships with the scientists and with the data users. 
and we'll continue to do that. The new version features the hourly data products to enable uh, usage of monitoring and modeling of building systems on an hourly basis. And so we'll continue with uh, our, uh, our current partnerships to and, and welcome your feedback uh, so that we can continue to improve the way the Earth observations are made available to the public through our, our power tool. So again, we thank you for joining us for this webinar and we hope that it is helpful and we invite you to ask questions uh, that we'll try to answer in our next portion. Thank you again. And uh, just want to thank you for, uh, for attending today. And uh, we're going to be now in our uh, question and answer session. And uh, also, we'd like to uh, invite you to participate in our homework assignment to, to uh, just give you a sense of review of these four different uh, webinars that we provided in this series, overviewing how one might be able to use earth, uh, earth science, earth observation, information and uh, observations for the energy industry and energy related applications. And so um, you can go to that website and uh, that's listed here on this slide and uh, should be available, made available uh, and to you and uh, to participate in that homework assignment. So I hope that you can do that. And also there's a survey um, that uh, we would uh, appreciate you filling out and uh, giving us some feedback on these, all four of these webinars and in particular these last two that, uh, that we've presented to you. So now I'd like to go through some of the questions that have been asked so far and uh, see if we can't uh, answer those at least uh, orally. And uh, of course, uh, there's uh, our, our uh, email addresses are there at the, at the top. And uh, if you have some questions that we don't get to in this session, uh, you can certainly uh, go ahead and answer those. Uh, I mean, ask those and we'll try to answer them as we can. Uh, so the question number one was in the develop uh, satellite beach project can you explain what caused the variations of the heat map in the upper right hand uh, corner of the slide. Um, so I have to uh, review that slide again, but uh, those were, uh, I believe, the uh, the central one that that was the land surface temperature it looks like I pulled the wrong one in, in the quick uh, quickly trying to answer this question. The right had to do with the LIDAR, um, the LIDAR uh, return maps um, and uh, those were um, trying to get here to that uh, information. Uh, and of course, I couldn't find it here on the fly. Oh, there they are. Uh, so those were maps of, of PV potential, actually, that were output uh, by the project. So there's so the reddest colors on that slide had to do with the uh, the greatest potential, and the um, and so they had it color coded uh, by rooftop. So so that was the actual result of the project for that for that particular map. So I'll write that answer a little more clearly uh, for the uh, for the for the for the document here. And uh, question number two is: Was spatial resolution available in the power uh, red screen for solar radiation data products? The current version is uh, all the data is based upon. Uh, one by one degree data that we replicated to half by half for the current version. And uh, we'll providing the raw resolution for the, the next version and uh, looking into uh, trying to provide true uh, higher resolution solar radiances in the future. Uh, question number three, what would be the cost ratio, ben cost benefit ratio, how much cost Per, per square foot of solar panel and maintenance cost? What are the level of technical knowledge and training is required to maintain solar panels? Is the uh, public capable of maintaining solar panels in a technical aspect? Well, 
these are really questions that a that a trained solar engineer or someone that's had um, some some coursework and some experience would really have to answer. Maybe one of the consultants that we work with. That's really beyond the scope of what we deal with here. Our concentration is providing the basic solar related information and meteorological quantities that a, that an engineer could pick up and use to make this sort of cost benefit ratio, uh, you know, uh, ratio analysis. The red screen provides a tool that actually does this. So you enter in, not only you pull in the climatological data products, but you also specify the, uh, the engineering aspects of the system that you wish to provide for a feasibility study. And if you go through step by step, then they'll have a cost benefit analysis at the end for each individual project that you select and want to, to work with. So I encourage you to, to look up the RET screen because they have uh, lots of, um, lots of uh, tutorial videos and uh, documentation on how they use their tool. And, uh, and uh, they are very, uh, very responsive in, in answering questions. Question number four, what is the NASA LARC solar panel? Well, that's just the two panels that are attached to a building to supplement the energy. And this building that we showed on the slide was our badge and pass office. So anyone that visited, visits NASA Langley has to go through the badge and pass office. They decided to add those solar panels to supplement the energy uh, and reduce the amount of energy used from the, from the grid. And uh, we also have uh, some uh, very, uh, we have several other buildings now, and we're continuing to update the buildings and uh, making them uh, conform to uh, industry standards for energy efficiency. Uh, and so uh, that's one of the reasons that they've used RET screen for the entire center. So, uh, so exciting there on uh, able to uh, improve our, our facilities. Okay, what site is to download climate data? Uh, I think we've we'll put we'll put the relevant links, but uh, you can see here. So, so the best way to do that is go to the main page and select the data access viewer, and then that comes up. And you'll see uh, these little uh, shapes uh, that identify apps. So the single point app is the app that you'll want. And then if you click on that blue, it's blue. If you click on that, you'll get a series of questions. The first question is you, for you to identify what major community you're within. Uh, and then the, uh, the, uh, the next question will ask you if you uh, or if you want a uh, time series data or climatological data. So it gives you options. Do you want daily data, uh, monthly data, annual, and uh, climatological? So that's where you specify you want climatological. And when you do that, uh, as you scroll down in the tool, you'll see all the value added and other products that you could select to, to view. And uh, if you get on there, uh, we we have a tutorial uh, that shows you how to uh, to navigate through that site. Uh, question number six: How about daily precipitation parameter usage from power? I obtained it last year from my study area. That was something distributed per day, every day, showing less precipitation, like 0.2 millimeters. Uh, I think this is not usable because the uh, precipitation evaporates immediately. Okay, um, the the precipitation comes from the MARE 2 atmospheric reanalysis. Um, I, I'll actually have to look into this question a little bit because I think there was a bug from the older version where the wrong units were there. Um, I think we put an announcement on that website there in the uh, FAQ, but uh, but but uh, we'll we'll take I'll take a little second look at that and refresh that'll be all corrected in the beta version um but uh but uh, look for that um so we might have to do some follow-up on that particular question are you planning to add performance optimal performance calculations for hydropower plants actually this was a question i was just asked yesterday um and we don't currently have uh support information regarding uh, hydropower um, because we don't have information uh, regarding uh, the reservoir stream flow 
uh, the, the watershed analysis. So that would take a hydrological analysis. And um, we have parameters that you could use the input to do a hydrological analysis, such as the net fluxes, both the solar and thermal infrared irradiance, uh, which are related to evaporation at the surface. We have the temperatures and humidities, uh, but uh, we don't have the information that uh, does the stream flow. Uh, and uh, this is a gridded precipitation product, so there probably are biases, particularly in mountainous regions um, where uh, where uh, the, the precipitation, some of the enhanced effects due to, from the topography aren't, aren't captured. Um, so that would have an impact on as many of these reservoirs are, are used for hydrological uh, power, our uh, hydropower, our, uh, our elevated uh, reservoirs. Um, so that would be be relevant. So, so uh, that might be something we would consider in the future, uh, but right now we don't support explicitly uh, hydropower. Um, and uh, thanks. Thanks for uh, for participating on the on the workshops. Question number eight: When calculating the optical tilt uh, tilting angle for solar panels, does the model take other parameters like the position of the sun into consideration? For example, topography and clouds. Clouds, absolutely. So this is all sky consideration. So those optimal tilts are configured with. Uh, especially for the uh, climatological parameters. So they consider the climatological cloud patterns. Uh, so, so that is considered uh, specifically. Now, in terms of if you're in a mountainous area and you get shadowing uh, from mountain ranges, or that is not at, considered at this time. Uh, so uh, we do have basic elevation, so the fluxes are are adjusted for elevation, but uh, we do not have uh, shadowing effects in the current data products. Okay, so, um, and, and of course, all the solar positions are accounted for. Uh, the current version does this in a, in a kind of a climatological sense uh, by using an industry standard parameterization using the, uh, using a, a, a middle, middle day of a month and uh, so we use a parameterization and uh, and then we compute all the solar uh, angles relative to that the new version actually more explicitly is going to be uh, computing direct and diffuse fluxes for every hour uh, and uh, throughout the time history and so we'll be able to explicitly average those quantities and provide a, an estimate uh, that considers the changes in clouds and um, and aerosols and uh, and other factors that influence all the factors that influence those solar radiances. Okay. Um, question number nine: Satellite Beach Energy Project sounds really interesting. Is there a link to a full report? Um, looks like we've dropped that link right in there for you, so you can take a look at that. Uh, you talked about the partnership with uh, different organizations. Are you considered partnering with SIDS, developing countries, governments, or technical assistance in areas such as uh, EO applications? Could you elaborate on that? Well, um, we have, I don't know what SIDS is. Are you talking about USAID? Uh, maybe you're talking about USAID. We have, um, in the past, I showed you a, slide from this the uh swera project which is a very old project so over 10 years ago but but we did have some uh contact with usaid at that time we have not had much contact with them since um and so that might be something that we could could reach out to in the future so we we haven't we've started to reach out to some philanthropic uh, organizations to see if there's some connections and uh so we're, we're hoping to expand on uh, nonprofits and other uh, other uh, organizations that uh, do reach out to uh, to developing areas, uh, but we haven't uh, have any formal formal uh, formal uh, agreements. And so, okay, so thank you for expanding SIDS to small island developing states. Um, 
So no, we have not uh, reached out to them. Um, our own Department of Interior, I know, uh, in the uh, early 2000s did use our data set at that time to uh, look at the islands, part of the territories of the U.S. And, look, and do solar resource assessment. And I don't know if the Department of Interior has updated that um, at this time. We've had some contact with Department of Interior, uh, and uh, it's one of the reasons that we tried to go and support the GIS systems, uh, and we're continuing to uh, try to make it more amenable uh, to their systems. And so hopefully there might be some more uh, future interaction with Department of Interior and other entities. Okay, um, how could I compare satellite and station data? Well, um, first of all, it depends on what parameters you are interested in. So, so these typically observations are, are radiation observations. So if you're talking about solar energy, um, the radiation observations are available through a uh, network called the Baseline Surface Radiation Network. Uh, and so uh, it's fairly complicated to get observations from them. There are second, uh, observa second measurements at each site are provided by seconds, but there's alternative uh, places to obtain measurements. One of those is NOAA. So if you're interested in the uh, um, U.S. area, NOAA maintains several sites that uh, measure solar and thermal infrared fluxes. Uh, that's called the SURF RAD network. We can provide some links to that if you're interested in that. Uh, also, um, there is another international network of solar irradiance, but those are only at the monthly averages. That's called the GEBA Global Energy Balance Archive. So, uh, but those are not provided on a daily basis, just monthly. Um, in terms of meteorological observations, those are all uh, that we we compare to. We use the NOAA's uh, archives. So they have both a, uh, a daily summary of the day archive for daily averages and also uh, an hourly average uh, archive. And uh, our webinar number three, uh, uh, identify those and that we use those and our methodology uh, also uh, we're building it up for the beta for the hourly comparisons but the current methodology online describes our comparisons to the meteorological uh, measurements for the daily averages so so what you would do is go to the power and pull the location that you're interested in. You get the time series and whatever temporal resolution you are interested in. And then you would have to reach out to one of these other services to uh, obtain the, uh, the uh, surface sites. Now, in the future, we actually have, uh, uh, we mentioned our Esri story map that uh, where we have pulled those for the user, we have envisioned a uh, a tool that we're developing that will enable the user to obtain either the weather or uh, eventually we hope the solar radiance measurements from different networks around the world and be able to do their own comparisons uh, that GIS tool is in development and not yet available but it's it's on the map so hopefully at one day you can come to power and do that uh, for a particular location uh, utilizing power capabilities, but for right now, you'd have to pull the power uh, based time series and obtain the uh, surface radiation uh, data your, your cells or, or the surface meteorological uh, measurements. Okay, um, question number 12. Is there any data available for NASA related to migratory birds mapping from Argos? Uh, I don't know about that. Uh, so I guess I would have to do a little bit of footwork to see if there's anything uh, related to that. Um, so I guess I, I don't have to say I don't know off the top of my head about that. Question number 13. Are you generally open to student projects at the level of thesis for focused use cases uh, like adding hydrological models in cooperation with power plant owners? Absolutely. We work with students a lot. We have uh, and support uh, when students ask questions. We try to answer the questions to the best of our ability and allow them to uh, 
to uh, do their work. So we welcome student involvement, and uh, we've uh, we've had professors use power for uh, renewable energy classes and solar classes, looking at the various different uh, design of uh, panel systems and evaluating how solar resources change at various uh, climate uh, regions and locations around the world. So uh, ap we're absolutely uh, would would love to work with students as we can. Um, and uh, support you in, in any work that you have. Uh, I guess uh, we have uh, someone helping to answer questions. We actually have interns. We have an intern. We do have an intern program as well. Uh, and uh, we, we do have support selected. But uh, those, those become very uh, competitive, unfortunately. I wish we could accept all the students for internships. But we had over 50 apply for the opportunity we had, and, and I could only select a couple. So uh, that's that's uh, that's a little hard. But if if you even if you're not a direct intern, uh, you can if you have particular questions, uh, you're welcome to submit those questions, and uh, we'll try to answer them as as we have time. Um, if you go to the website, there's a there's a link that uh, where you can submit questions. You can also go through the Atmospheric Science Data Center's uh, forum, and they have an answer, question answer forum in there where, where we, we uh, also will answer questions. And that, that link should be uh, on the website. Well, we can put it in here in this question. Um, number 14, a local electrical power company told me that they can track the movement of rainstorm across the surface area as the demand for power drops with rooftop evaporation. Is it possible to calibrate uh, the reduction in energy consumption from anticipated rainfall? Well, I would say probably, uh, but I, we haven't done anything like that. We haven't looked at uh, short-term forecasts. Um, if you have a relationship that seems to track well like that and you can obtain uh, short-term forecasts, uh, then uh, you might be able to to do something, but we at the moment we we don't uh, have forecasts featured. We'll be probably looking at longer term forecasts in the future uh, related to climate climate changes that we anticipate at least uh, have a probability of occurring, and uh, and in the long term perhaps some seasonal as well. So, but uh, at this time, we don't have uh, short-term forecasts uh, information. So, okay, number 15. Is it possible to access meteorological like, data from different height of the atmosphere? Um, yes, we provide the, uh, using the MARE2 outputs, we provide temperature, and uh, winds and, uh, and uh, moisture information at two meters and 10 meters, and the winds, I think, at 50. Uh, I guess we have the temperatures as, as well, 50 meter uh, resolution across the surface. Uh, so we'll, we'll clarify exactly what we have, um, and that's the levels that we're currently using in the output of MERA 2. Uh, I will say future, the GMAO is working on future uh, reanalysis products and, uh, and they are considering adding uh, more levels and particularly treating the boundary layer. So that might be something that we would bring to you in the future. How can we track cyclone paths? Is there a model or a process? Um, so I, I, I don't know if you're looking at tropical systems or if uh, you're just looking at general uh, mid latitude storms tracks and systems. Probably uh, you would probably best uh, go to the uh, the Mara two products themselves. Uh, it, it, you could go to the NASA's uh, GMAO website, the Mara two. If you're looking at historical uh, and they can they, they have some tools online that you could visualize. Um, so we'll add some information to that. Eventually, we'll be building out some image services. We, we have 
plans to provide daily uh, image services uh, in conjunction with the power tool. Uh, right now, we just have the climatological image services, but um, well, we hope to add at least daily and perhaps uh, hourly, at least for short time series, uh, where you can uh, leaf through, or essentially uh, go through a number of images in time and and see the progression. If so. I'd, so I guess it depends on your question is whether or not you want a, a real quantitative tracking or if you just want to visualize it. Um, so you could go today to the Meritude tools and look at uh, some of the tools that they have to visualize the, the products and look at particular products. Maybe you want to look at cloud fraction or, um, or precipitation or one of those fields. And then you could probably see then the the, uh, the uh, look at the tracks uh, in the in the in the future. We'll hopefully have that as a feature to image service so that you could do that, and uh, you'll be able to download um, those images as well in in a uh, probably a GeoTIFF type of format that you could utilize in GIS analysis. And uh, yeah. Someone's uh, adding that uh, you can also go to the GPM uh, iMERGE data to get precipitation if you're looking at, at the precipitation uh, fields. And of course, uh, NOAA has a number of uh, number of resources online where you can track not only the uh, certainly track the predicted course of of uh, systems, um, but uh, but uh, you they should have some uh, historical, or at least uh, within a few weeks, uh, you can look at that. So there's there's resources uh, online uh, that uh, besides uh, besides power for that. Okay. Um, can ASHRAE uh, and power applications uh, free download for any country besides the custom? We have global data products, so everywhere is free. So you can download the data for anywhere in the world. Um, we don't have the products. So if you want to develop products by country, we don't we don't have the products orderable by country in terms of a polygon. Uh, say you want to uh, just get a, an average for particular nations by boundaries. We don't have that at the time. At this time, you would be you would have to go ahead and define the latitude and longitudinal uh, grid grids that cover that nation, and then go ahead and design an API script to repeatedly uh, request and query for the parameters you want over that nation, and then you could build you could build in and put that pull that into a GIS tool and work with that to to do a, a boundary analysis if you if you want to do that, but you can at least take the latitude longitude um, grid boxes that we provide and uh, get a quick assessment uh, using a mean if, if that's what you're you're interested in to do, to do that but uh, the free it's free for anywhere in the world so uh, if we if we allow users free access now that's part of NASA's work is is global we will we like to say uh, global is NASA's local and uh, so we do provide global products, and um, and uh, we try to, and, and those are all freely available as part of our Earth Earth observations and and uh, mineralogical uh, science uh, products and modeling, and so that's what we're making available to the public. Any system or prediction for earthquakes? Well, we do have a disasters portal. Um, I don't know if they have earth. I doubt they. I don't know of earthquake prediction. I'll say it that way. Um, they do have uh, information on landslides uh, in that disasters portal. This is an area that NASA's land um, uh, team. Uh, well, they have a. a you know, I got, uh, lost of words, but they they do have uh, emphasis on on geography. Uh, but I'm I'm not. Uh, I'm not uh, uh, part of that project, so um, so I don't know specifically what resources are available. 
Um, but uh, but the disaster portal does have some information on landslides. So if that might be helpful, I don't I don't I don't know particularly. Okay. Well, uh, we've actually uh, surpassed our uh, time for this. Uh, we're past an hour and a half. Um, but uh, if, is there any other questions that anyone has? And of course, again, you're welcome to submit additional questions. And uh, we really do thank you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, hopefully, uh, the webinar and some of the questions we reviewed were helpful for you. But if not, or if you have remaining questions, please please don't hesitate to to send us an email. We also encourage all those that have participated in the four webinars uh, to, to uh, find, the, uh, find the homework and do the homework and also to, uh, to submit a survey uh, and uh, provide us any feedback. We're welcome feedback and uh, want to improve both uh, the representation of these, uh, these webinars and the information, but we also want to improve our actual tools and uh, hopefully you've learned a lot about how NASA's Earth observations can be utilized in the energy uh, for energy related questions. And, and specifically, these last two webinars focused on this power tool that we've developed in hopes that we can we can provide further support for uh, for electrical energy applications and renewable energy applications and featuring solar and also sustainable buildings and uh, and uh, and other applications so thank you again for your time and uh and and we and uh please uh yeah thanks thanks again and all the best to you thank you